for being here. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, the legacy of last atmospheric uh, measurements is really a, a great story. And unfortunately, Charles Barth can't be here because he was the main driver for all this. And when we talk about SME, we talk about Snowy, which is 17 years later, uh, Charles Barth, the principal investigator of both these missions. Pretty incredible, actually, when you think about it. Uh, I won't be able to do everything you would like to hear tonight about these two missions. The, the breadth of these missions is really amazing. And if you uh, had five of these talks for each mission, you could probably cover it. Okay, so we're, we're gonna get an abbreviated uh, kind of thing tonight. And um, just to uh, tell you what, the, the SME ozone data is now being analyzed by uh, Dr. Amy Merkel and has shown some new results. It's a new result from a 30-year-old mission. I mean, this is amazing, right? This is what's the enduring legacy that we talk about for some of these missions. And the current uh, for SNOWY, uh, again, um, analysis that just happened the last couple of years from a satellite that was launched in the 90s. So pretty amazing stuff. Uh, it, it, much of this had to wait for the models to catch up to it, right? Very innovative science, innovative measurements for both of these instruments, or both of these missions. SME um, contained two instruments designed to measure ozone. We will deal mostly with the UVS instrument tonight. Uh, there's just a, a summary of, of all the kinds of things that SME would, has measured, and we'll get into it a little bit later. I want to uh, keep going. Um, over 100 graduate and undergraduate students were involved with every aspect of SME. It's a legacy of LASP and, and Charles Barth. This was the first satellite, the first satellite that was operated fully by a university. So, so this was a big breakthrough for uh, education in particular at universities. Very profound thing, because if you were a student and you were applying, an undergraduate student who was applying to uh, uh, some, uh, to graduate school or to a company, and you said, I operated a NASA satellite, I mean, that's not bad, right? That gives you a little bit of edge, I would say. So uh, that's what we saw here. Uh, again, Charles Barst was the, uh, the principal investigator, and there's a list of co-investigators here. And the Mission Control Center here, launched on October 6, 1981, uh, which if, if you happen to be here, that was an exciting evening. SNOWY is a small scientific satellite designed, built, and operated by a university, of course, uh, to measure nitric oxide in the terrestrial lower thermosphere in the 100 to 200 kilometer region and analyze the energy inputs into, from the sun and the magnetosphere that create its abundance and shows that it vary, varies dramatically. SNOWY was one of three satellite projects selected for Student Explorer Demonstration Initiative. So a very profound thing to have be one of the three that were selected in the highly competitive types of, uh, of com competitions, okay? So again, uh, Snowy was uh, mission um, and principal investigator Charles Barth. There were several instruments, student-run uh, operations, very very important. The uh, last currently operates is it four or three satellites, Bill? Four. Four. Yes. Bill per Bill Purcell is here. He's the director of mission operations, and this is really a profound thing at uh, at a university. You know, there are uh, professionals and uh, students that are uh, doing all of the work uh, on call 24 hours a day. Very, very, very uh, big and, and important part of LASP. And they're operating now the AIM mission. And what are the other ones, Bill, quick? Kepler, Source, and QuickScan. Quick, yeah, let's go. And there's a number of them in, uh, in planning, too. Right? So, very good thing. Okay, what we're going to talk about mostly tonight is ozone in the mesosphere, 
nitric oxide in the thermosphere, uh, the mesosphere, as you know, begins about 50 kilometers high. It's, it's at the point, starts at the point where the uh, temperature profile begins to cool. Okay, and this cooling of this part is uh, uh, part of what makes it an interesting thing with the ozone. Most of the ozone, of course, uh, resides in the stratosphere. It protects us against the ultraviolet light that is coming in. So, uh, very interesting things in the mesosphere and in the thermosphere. Uh, and SME was selected because it recognized and could measure the important components that, because there was a severe lack of measurements uh, relating to mesospheric processes at the time. So it was uh, especially uh, coordinated and the, and the instruments that were, that were designed for, for SME were especially uh, tuned to that part of the atmosphere. And we lacked a unifying theory of ozone and many mesospheric processes at that time. So it fit right in with what was needed uh, in the mesosphere. So most of the uh, studies had to do with the earth ozone layer. There was a lot of, a lot of things, and this is what I say. There's so many facets, uh, facets to these measurements and these missions that we could stand up here for a long time to, to give you all of the information. So we're, we're studying uh, when what I'm going to concentrate on is, is the mesospheric ozone part of it, especially the lower mesosphere. When you, the, the two satellites operate in the same fashion. Uh, the fields of view of the instruments went down through the Earth's atmosphere as the, as the satellites were spinning. And so you get contributions from all of these uh, regions along the line of sight of the instruments. The solar radiation comes in. It's scattered by the neutral atmosphere. It's called Rayleigh scattering. And if there's ozone or some other absorbent in there, then part of that is absorbed out. And by looking at the shape of the, of the profile, you can determine what the ozone content is. And that's what we'll do. These, here's, here's the, basically the uh, formulation. We won't go through that now, but we'll, let me show you. Uh, for example, here are six uh, profiles at one, uh, one irradiance channel, six at the other, five spins, or six spins every five degrees, and they're bundled together. And here they are. Uh, and then you start with an initial guess. And part of this is this really scattering at the top, so you have something to normalize to. There's no ozone absorption up there. And then as the satellite measures lower and lower in the atmosphere, you get this absorption peak. So that's what ozone is doing that. And then you start out with an initial guess, and you say, what do I have to do to that particular profile so that the uh, the ozone that I put into the atmosphere provides the proper absorption so that I get out the measured radiance. Very simple, isn't it? <laughs> Took us a while to do it. <laughs> okay, so that, that's where we're going. And then for these, these profiles, uh, here's a couple of ozone profiles uh, that are going to be, we're going to exploit tonight from approximately 45 to 70 kilometers from the UVS, the ultraviolet spectrometer. Uh, here's a, the density and the mixing ratio uh, for these two and for this particular measurement. So this is the kind of thing that was measured for about six years on SME. Uh, every day, three or four orbits a day at all latitudes where the sun was up, okay? At about three o'clock in the afternoon. Chemistry of ozone, even in the mesosphere, is not simple. Uh, the source of ozone is, is relatively simple. It's uh, molecular oxygen being dissociated and the three-body reaction of O plus O2 uh, giving ozone. Ozone losses are a little bit more complicated and this is part of the issue that we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, you have just the, the two-body recombination of the oxygen itself or hydrogen uh, which comes from the photolysis of water, or the breakup of water in the upper atmosphere. 
destroying an ozone and forming an OH. Now this OH then um, is involved in the catalytic destruction of ozone, which is the biggest loss process of ozone in the mesosphere. OH attacks an, an O3, you get an HO2, which attacks an O3, and you get the OH back. So this is catalysis. It goes over and over again. The net result is you take two ozones and recombine it into three O2s, where you started from. Okay. So we have to understand these processes. We have to understand how much OH is there, um, and so forth. So this is a, a scheme that shows you some of the time constants that are involved. We won't go into that right now, but, but this is the idea. So there were um, the three papers that were initially published on this. Uh, Susan Solomon, uh, one by myself and one by Todd Clancy, um, found out that, well, you know, you take those reactions, you take what you know about the atmosphere, and you calculate the ozone, and by golly, it doesn't work. Okay? So, here, here's the, uh, the model from Solomon, the earlier model, and the UVS measurements as a function of latitude. Uh, this is a mixing ratio. For January at 0.134 millibars, that's uh, one of the higher altitude ones, around a half a millibar, the same situation. You're just not generating enough ozone in the model to satisfy the measurements. That was the famous ozone deficit problem. And we'll show you that this deficit problem took a long time to resolve. In the, uh, the paper that I did with Rich Ekman, uh, we looked at profiles of, uh, against, of, of mixing ratio of ozone against a, a, what we thought was an improved model. Okay, But the model still did not produce the ozone that we saw. And later on, uh, Todd Clancy uh, published in 1987. This is, you know, a number of years after launch when we're trying to understand what's going on and found, of course, the same thing. The models still fell below the ozone. Now, this is one of the legacies of it. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, besides the papers that we published, there is a series of papers that have tried to attack this problem all the way up to the, to the 2000, and, and really even beyond. But, but Marty Melenzek did a, did a very good job, and, and part of the problem, what we said was, boy, you know, if there's one reaction rate we're really measured wrong in the laboratory, uh, we could probably solve this problem. And it turned out that it was wrong, but it was only a partial solution. But we're still doing pretty good, okay? Uh, some of the other uh, near-infrared ozone, which we haven't had a chance to talk about, was modified because some of these reactions were modified. But this rate, uh, the OH plus HO2 reaction, we, uh, this is the, the loss of, of odd hydrogen. And we thought, well, we should have a higher reaction rate. If that was a higher reaction rate, it would solve all the problems. And finally, the JPL compilation uh, that came out later did increase that reaction rate, uh, but not, not enough. So we never did get complete closure on that problem. The problem is that if you don't have the, uh, you don't have the models working right, and you want to generate a model atmosphere, calculate the temperature profile with the model atmosphere, you've got to have the right ozone because it is a, one of the major heating uh, the, the absorption by radiation is one of the major heating functions in the atmosphere. So, so you need to have that right, or, or you're not going to get the right atmosphere. You're not going to be able to build an atmosphere that looks that's realistic. So, so this this is a, an important problem, and uh, I think we're doing pretty well on it now. But, um, and then, this is just a comparison of some ozone data. Uh, a lot of people say, well, maybe your ozone data is wrong. 
you know, maybe, maybe you made an error in your calibrations or some things. And, and here we, we see uh, the diamonds are the ozone data and the uh, solid lines here are one of the later um, instruments, measurements that measured ozone in this region. And you can see we're pretty good. Uh, pretty good comparison in most cases on these aver in an average sense. So probably not the measurement. Probably not the measurement. Okay, something else, which we uh, never discovered, or we're very close. So uh, other other problems overtook the the modelers, and they they went into the stratosphere, I suppose, to to try that. And the British Antarctic uh, Survey Data Center uh, uses the SME uh, ozone data as part of the, what they call their model atmosphere, the model ozone data. That's kind of a good compliment, you know. Uh, Gerald Keating in 1989 published this and uh, the ozone data was put into the, to that particular uh, data center. Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide for now. Uh, and after SME, uh, a number of instruments began measuring uh, mesospheric ozone. Big breakthrough was SME, and people then realized how important it was to have that measurement. So even some of the, the uh, like SABRE, which is really uh, designed to measure ozone really in the stratosphere, that was what its major thing was, was doing uh, mesospheric ozone measurements as well. And we're gonna see the results of, of some of the SABRE compared to SME in a different sense uh, in just a minute. Okay, um, in, in late last year and early this year, uh, Amy Merkel, who's at LASP, and Amy is, is actually a, a graduate of the SNOWY uh, mission. Uh, she got her degree working on the SNOWY mission in a, in a different capacity. But Amy is now measuring uh, uh, running global models of the atmosphere like we just talked about, trying to understand how the minor species affect uh, the changes in the atmosphere. Okay, <laughs> so she took the SME ozone data that we've been showing you and she analyzed it in a new way. So here's a 30 year old data set being taken by someone and analyzed in a, in a very new way that is uh, going to contribute to the understanding of atmospheric changes due to the solar cycle. And that's what this paper is about, okay? Uh, it's being written up now, it was presented at a couple of meetings. Uh, so SME uh, it did measure the solar irradiance, which we didn't get into. And it had, the, of course, the UV ozone channel it covered parts of solar cycle 21-22 uh, with good ozone measurements for the six years between 1982 and 1986. And here is that part of the solar cycle, declining solar cycle. And that was part of the idea is to look at, to get that. Um, so at the 3 p.m. profiles of, of SME were analyzed by Amy and I'll show you the results in a minute. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, so, and it shows that the results are consistent with what Shaber has seen in terms of the solar cycle variation, which is, again, a new result for a 30-year-old data set. Not a is bad there deal, some right? Significance to, I'm sorry? Is there some significance to the 3 p.m.? Why 3 p.m.? Why is that? Okay. Um, the, I, the, the, if I remember, and Gary might be able to help me. <laughs> The 3 p.m. Uh, was chosen uh, because that's when the, the ozone had settled down mostly from its diurnal cycle. Okay, so it was pretty much in photochemical equi equilibrium and, and still did give us a, uh, uh, an excursion into the high latitudes. Okay. And then, of course, LC, uh, when it began to drift to later and later times, uh, later in its lifetime. But is that is that sort of right, Gary? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So so it was the time when 
you could say the ozone is, is now really in photochemical equilibrium to help you understand it. What, what Amy's found out, very interesting point actually, is that if you take measurements from some of the instruments, especially the occultation instruments, which are always either in the AM or PM, that because of the diurnal variation, they're very much, very hard to interpret in this sense. Okay, because at, at twilight, ozone's changing rapidly, especially in the mesosphere. Uh, because of the chemistry and how it's changing. So, so the daytime measurement is, is important in this. Okay, that's a good point though, thank you. So we have this uh, measurement of, of, of uh, solar cycle dependence of, of SME and again, a new result from this. And here it is, um, here's the, the SME result is in red. And uh, these are, are uh, Amy has taken orbit by orbit measurements throughout this period and averaged them in a specific way to give her a, uh, to show if there's a solar cycle response in the instrument. It's from 1982 up to 1986 or a little later. And what you see in the ozone results, and this is at a particular altitude, um, I'll show you the rest in a minute, that yes indeed, at this altitude there is a solar cycle response. And it's in fact, uh, uh, as the solar intensity decreases at this altitude, the ozone increases. Okay, And that's because of the uh, ionization, uh, uh, dissociation effects and so on that occur at this altitude. So here's the, the blue is the uh, SABRE result for uh, solar cycles 23-24. A uh, little bit more action in theirs, but every solar cycle is different. If you smooth that data, uh, you get a similar result, okay? You get a, an increase in the ozone uh, as the solar cycle decreases because you lose the photolysis of ozone, uh, the photolysis of O2. So you lose a little bit of the source function and the ozone decreases. Over here, uh, this is the result as a function of pressure or altitude, and this talks about the, uh, this axis is a percent solar variation. So as you, as we said before, at these higher uh, altitudes, lower pressures, the, uh, the, so, the uh, ozone solar cycle dependence is anti-correlated with the solar cycle. At the higher pressures, uh, you see it turns over about one millibar, which is the stratopause. Uh, the ozone becomes positively correlated with the solar cycle. Okay, and that has that's a temperature effect, but you can see that that SME really has nailed this. I mean, this is this is really neat. This is taking the SME stuff from um, 30 years ago. Imagine that. You know, I was, I was young then, and, 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 and deriving a new result. Very nice, very nice uh, result. And it agrees in this region uh, pretty well with the, with the sophisticated and uh, expensive saber instrument. I had to say that, I'm sorry. So, nice result, right? Excellent. So that's the legacy of SME, new stuff. And, and Gary and I were talking before the, the meeting, if we had the chance to go back, if we had the funding or if we ha had the time and look at the SME data, I'm sure we would be able to find more nuggets in it. Okay. Turning now to the uh, Student Nitric Oxide Explorer, I showed this one before. Um, in the thermosphere, in the 100 to 200 kilometer region that where, where ozone or nitric oxide was measured, uh, these are a couple of the basic reaction. The first thing you have to do in order to produce nitric oxide is you have to produce nitrogen atoms. And so that means you have to bake up N2, which is strongly bonded, as you know. So it takes energy to do this. And so, uh, 
part of the energy, a lot of the really high energy stuff is absorbed in this region from the sun. And also there's particle stuff going on, which I'll show you in a minute, which is really, really exciting. So you get electrons, photoelectrons that have been produced by ionization, uh, breaking up uh, N2, there should be an electron over there as well. And you get some excited N2, and this plays a key role in the production of nitric oxide. You get NO plus. NO is, of course, one of the more easily ionized constituents in the atmosphere. It's also formed by other reactions. It uh, recombines, and most of it goes to NAAD. And you get NO plus recombination, giving you N4 to dust. But let me show you what happens. The primary source of NO in the thermosphere then turns out to be the reaction of this excited nitrogen atom with oxygen. Okay, very fast, very fast reaction. And uh, we didn't, we just discovered this actually just before Snowy was launched, where we began to understand uh, the NO chemistry in this respect. N corded S uh, reacts with O2 also to give nitric oxide, very highly temperature dependent reaction because it, the only the tail of the energy in the thermal energy can really make this reaction happen. However, uh, it turns out that this n this ground state nitrogen, reacting with NO is a major loss of NO in the thermosphere. So this, this, <laughs> this little molecule, this atom, is both creating and primarily, though, destroying nitric oxide. Okay, And you get some photolysis of NO as well. But the way these two interact is, is very interesting and we'll show you a result about that in just a minute. So here is a uh, result of uh, uh, nitric oxide density uh, as a function of geomagnetic latitude, in this case for the spring equinox in March of 1998. Okay, And what you see, of course, is sort of what we expected, that, that the, uh, the poles, and remember this is, a, this is the time of relatively high um, solar activity, which was designed to be that way when, when Snowy was launched. And you find that, boy, you know, at the, at the, uh, at the poles, you get a buildup of nitric oxide. <clears throat> and that's, of course, because you're getting particle precipitation. You're getting uh, uh, additional ionization from a roll and other electrons from protons that are entering the atmosphere. And, and this ionization, of course, is the precursor to the generation of nitric oxide. Okay, And so you have it. That is, of course, in addition to what the sun is doing. And the sun is ionizing, but you can see the difference. Pretty profound difference here. This is about 2.2 times 10 to the 8, you know, order of magnitude almost between what's at the pole and what's at the at the equator under standard normal conditions. Kind of interesting. So everyone says, oh, we got to look at this, right? Because that's where all the fun is. That's where we're going to see that. Now, if you take a couple of years of data, this is at 106 kilometers. This is where the normally the nitric oxide peaks in the thermosphere. This is near the peak. And you take these two years of measurements and you look at the variability. And it's significant. Uh, see, this is, uh, a lot of this is solar rotational variability. There's hot spots on the sun uh, giving off electrons. Now we call them coronal mass injections and other things. But, but flares and other things that uh, rotate around on, and have a pseudo 27 day variation. And they're giving off uh, these energetic particles that are ending the atmosphere, ionizing and producing nitric oxide. Okay. The two years are very different, as you can see. Um, at least it appeared to me there's a lot more nitric oxide in this year at the poles than, than this year. However, one of the interesting things that happened is that uh, when you look at some of these excursions, uh, you see very pretty much at the equator, kind of a bland uh, distribution of nitric oxide. 
and at some of the uh, latitudes here between 0 and minus 30, just the background NO, so to speak, that's created by the sun. However, at times, you see these excursions of, of NO into the lower latitudes. You know, this, this uh, is still a lot of NO. It's in the 10 to the 8th range out here at, uh, at 30 degrees south. What's happening? Very interesting. We'll show you what's happening in a minute. Okay, and in other places too. You see uh, excursions into this part of the atmosphere, big buildups, perhaps. Um, and not all of this ozone can be contributed to just the solar cycle or the solar irradiance. Something else is going on, and that something else uh, had to wait until the models were sufficient enough to understand what was happening. What's happening is it's kind of interesting. Now, um, this is from a paper uh, by Charlie Barth and, and Scott Bailey, where they took a, a thermospheric uh, photochemical model um, and it was a one-dimensional model. So this is looking at the vertical structure in, in one dimension of nitric oxide. Okay, so this model is a little bit tuned to get to get the answer, but uh, that's fine. And this is this is equatorial data. Okay, so you see that the the nitric oxide is is reproduced fairly well by the model. Okay, uh, this is ju just considering solar flux. There's no particle interactions here, that kind of thing. So this is at the equator, that's why it was they chose to model it there because the influences from the higher latitudes uh, were almost almost never made it to the equator. Okay, so now you understand a little bit about that. And then you can look at the, uh, the total array of nitric oxide uh, from 110 kilometers, for example, in this calculations of the model, which is the red line, uh, to the data. And by golly, that's not bad. You see, you see the uh, the cyclic effects in there due to solar flux changes um, and you, you miss in a couple of places but you but you've really done a good job you know so so you can say at certain times certain places I think I understand nitric oxide right okay uh, now however you go back and you analyze some of those cases where you saw the excursion of NO into the latitudes. Let me just skip that one. Here is, here is a blow up of one of those times. All right? So here is a, uh, uh, an, a snowy measurement of nitric oxide uh, in this, this day range in 1998. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> And what you see is a buildup of nitric oxide cyclically, but some of it reaching as high as the equator. I mean, this is a this is this is significant, significant dispersion. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that it's not nitric oxide that's being transported, but it's something else, and the something else was a, was an interesting discovery. What we thought at first, when we looked at this data, oh, that's just some kind of meridional wind It's carrying the nitric oxide from the pole into the lower latitudes, where it's been built up by precipitating electrons. Not quite. The real answer is more interesting than that, okay? And uh, let me show you another one. Here is a... Uh, a nitric oxide measurement by snowy at 150 kilometers. This is in the middle range uh, where we see nitric oxide build up down at low latitudes uh, and one of those excursions that we saw. Okay, and here we have um, the TIE GCM model of, of Robo that modeled this particular thing. And it looks pretty good, right? So, you know, this is 2009. This is, what, 
how many years after the uh, when, when Snowy was already gone. Get this model and, and try to understand this. So here's what's happening. You have dual heating uh, of, the, of the atmosphere at the high latitudes when the particles come in and, and you ionize and the atmosphere gets heated, you get currents and that heats up. And what happens to that then is you get generation of winds and gravity waves that come out of the polar re I'm sorry, out of the polar regions and penetrate to lower latitudes. Okay. Now, what, what happens during that time, this, as you can see, this, interestingly enough, the nitric oxide increases as you go to low latitudes. That's because you, you are transporting in this wind this, uh, from the pole that's been generated by this, by this dual heating, by this really large interference in the upper atmosphere at that point. These winds are strong and they, they get to the equator within a day. I mean, this is big stuff. In addition to that, the temperature of these winds are about 300 degrees above the background temperature. So you've heated significant, heated this atmosphere significantly, and you send it out of the poles, it comes screaming down here rapidly, and what you're seeing here, uh, because of the temperature, and if we, we go back to the temperature, uh, temperature dependent rate reactions that we saw before, this is nitric oxide being generated along the path of the winds by the, the sun in a different environment than you're used to because the temperature is so high. So as you come down here, you see the nitric oxide build up. Uh, you are grabbing the nitric oxide you make as you go along here. It's being transported uh, and you're making more and more as you go down. So it's building up on you. So you're generating nitric oxide as you go, if you will. It's not just a transport problem, it's the chemistry of nitric oxide along the path that, that as it builds up as you come farther south. Is it obvious from an atmospheric dynamic standpoint why the path is north-south or so strongly north-south? Oh, it's, it's because the, the source of the, uh, of the dual heating is at the high, high latitudes. And, and that's what compel, uh, propels the winds. Okay, so, so when you get a, when you heat the atmosphere, it expands and it, and it rushes out of there push, and, and generates a, a wind uh, towards it. And, and it would be true, this one we showed before, uh, from the southern hemisphere, it would be true that that wind would be in the northward direction. So it's, what we're seeing isn't necessarily a, a narrow path in a limited range of longitude or something. It's, good point. It's a, it's a disc at that latitude that's seen over and over again. That's right. That's right. This, okay. the, 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 that's a very good point, that these are uh, well-defined in longitude. That is correct, yes. So there, you, when you're looking at a particular part of this, of this uh, Data. These, these are not global phenomena. They're, they are longitudinally um, directed. That's correct. Depending on where and what time of day and where the geomagnetic equator is going or, uh, and, and how it's coming in. So, uh, very interesting point that uh, winds and waves generated not transport nitric oxide, but allow it to be created as you go along. Kind of interesting. And there it is, down at low latitudes. Uh, pretty neat result. So again, you know, the legacy, here we are in 2009, just beginning to understand this 20-year-old data, or 10-year-old data. It's very interesting stuff. And finally, uh, and I was, I was hoping that, you know, Charles could come tonight. Um, you know, he's my thesis advisor. Uh, I actually did some work on NO from a different satellite, but that's that was a long time ago. In fact, I was I was one of the first uh, 
there were four or five. I was one of the first four students or five, five students out of the astrogeophysics department, I believe, after Charles came. So you know how long ago that was. Okay, so the legacy of WASP, SME Snowy, and atmospheric science in general has been really the legacy of, of Professor Charles Barth. I mean, his ideas about the student involvement, about uh, managing the spacecraft here, uh, really have profoundly affected the science uh, and the ability to do science, uh, the education of, of undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, his impact on this field is, I believe, of enduring value, and I wish he was here so we could thank him personally because this is very important stuff, and thank you very much. I'll be happy to stay around and, and chat or if there are any questions or comments. Yes? Can you put in perspective the timing of, of the, um, the, the SME launch with the ozone uh, um, uh, concerns of the, the chlorofluorocarbons? What was the developed timing of those? The, um, the chlorofluorocarbon issue was primarily a stratospheric effect. Now there were uh, instruments up at this time and even before called uh, SBUV, Solar Backscatter Ultraviolet Instruments, that were looking down. Uh, and I, uh, the timing of it escapes me, but I do recall that the, uh, the initial <laughs> looks at this data, uh, oh, Gary, can you help me on that? The timing of the, it was not far from this, was it? When the the stratospheric ozone started to the, I was global, in, the global stratospheric ozone started to go down about 1970. Yeah, so it was before that, and yeah, and ozone. yeah, and mostly at the pole though, at the southern pole was where it was really uh, seen. That was called the ozone hole. Uh, no, that was. I'm talking about global ozone. Okay. The ozone hole came later. Yeah, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, SMA didn't discover the ozone hole. Well, it, it, it couldn't have, we didn't see down there far. If we were right? looking down low. If, if we were looking down, we probably would have. Yeah. But the one, <laughs> one of the interesting things about the ozone hole is that the, the first uh, measurements of it, the people who were analyzing that data didn't believe it. So they, they kept it under wraps for quite a while, I, I forget how long, till they, they realize, oh my gosh, this is, this is real stuff. We're missing ozone down here. Uh, so that was, that was kind of an interesting take to that. But I'm sorry, I can't give you the exact uh, timing. The discovery of the ozone hole came after SME. It came after SME? After SME launch. Okay. I can't remember exactly. But so. so, yeah, we missed the ball on the ozone hole because we're looking up too high. Looking up too high, but. Um, well, as you can see, it it wasn't bad science. <laughs> so, anyone else? Yeah, I want to ask about the gravity wave. You said that it yeah. sort of passed over that quickly, but oh, yeah. you think that a wave would have a net effect of zero on the nitrous dioxide? Right? Well, it was. It depends on what on the heating, right? Uh, and and I'm going to have to go back and understand this a little bit more myself. But um, the But apparently, the model um, generated because of the of the way the heating happens. It did generate gravity waves that actually did transport or did have a horizontal component to them. So this is something that I want to look at further. Uh, but I just didn't have all the information at this time. But the it's heating effect must be more important than the cooling effect, I guess. That well, that's right. That's yeah, these are large waves, very large, of course so that you're in the heating uh, part of it, right? Uh, yes, yes. And, and, and you're getting this warm wind from the north. A lot of people wish they had that <laughs> at, at, down here, right? At this time, it doesn't sound right. You know, you're, you get a warm wind out of the pole. I mean, very interesting. Uh, and there was another. This is 150. No. No, it doesn't. Probably there's some excursions, but because of the atmospheric density being much higher, and uh, it, it probably doesn't. 
In fact, the same amount of heating isn't going to give you the same, so same winds. The previous slides you showed where they, the incursions went all the way to the equator, those are at the higher altitude. Yeah, yes, yes, I'm sorry, yes, they are. But it's, it's kind of profound that you can uh, shake up the atmosphere in this kind of thing. So there's lots of other things that, you know, uh, take place when you do that kind of 300 degrees is huge. It changes the winds, it changes the chemistry as you see. Lots of things are different when you do that. So uh, when we have instruments now we're building that uh, are going to look at the temperature variations in this region of the atmosphere as one of their major goals and so um, we're going to be looking for these kinds of things as well. That's the gold instrument that will fly in 17 that LASP is building. So. Uh, Kind of a nice addition. You should have plotted the solar radiance over many solar cycles. Right. That was just in the UV. That's like the 2500 angstrom line. Uh, these are the. Uh, yes. These are. Uh, let me see. What does that say? Yeah, this is the radiance. Uh, the 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 integrated radiance over the uh, the UV that that ozone is sensitive to. That large variation, or that, does that say that most of the UV is really coming from solar flares? Is it so modulated with the solar flare? Oh, way up here? Yeah, the whole solar cycle variation in the UV radiance. No, it's not, not mostly coming. There's a lot of solar flare activity involved, especially at the maximum. <coughs> That's right. But there is a background as well, but which is which is modulated by... Uh, by uh, uh, high, high level kinds of activities okay, so like so. It doesn't turn to zero there, it's at three. I'm sorry? That's the baseline then. It's a fact, it could be a factor of two higher in solar flare activities then. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, and as you know, the last solar cycle was pretty wimpy. Kind of interesting in itself because it gave us other opportunities to study atmospheric interactions. So, yes, sir. I don't know Charles Barth, but when did he join CU and what was he doing before SME? He, he joined CU um, in uh, 1965, is that right? Yeah, so 1965. I came in 66 and became his student in 1967. So uh, he, was, he just came on as director of the laboratory at that time. And is that when the name was changed? That, Somebody mentioned that, but Charles said uh, no, it was already last. It was already last when I was, yeah, when I came. I don't know when, it, it was the upper air laboratory. And uh, they actually had, as I understand it, there were some captured V2 rockets they used for well, experiments, right? And back in the 40s. Back in the 40s, yeah. And that's when you went to White Sands and when you launched the rocket, you hit under a truck, you know, or something. But so, <laughs> it's a real pioneers, right? Charles came from JPL. Yeah, came from JPL. And he had made the first measurements of nitric oxide in the thermosphere by rockets. And so the, the satellite mission, the SME satellite mission was an expansion of that technology and that understanding. So we, at JPL he had flown the rockets that measured nitric oxide for the first time. UV spectrometry. UV spectrometry. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. And there was a lot of, of uh, advances at that time in the spectrometric uh, instrumentation, uh, not only by, by Charles, but by others. And uh, we discovered the much, much, much about the solar flux and, the, and, revert, uh, and the, the lines in the solar spectrum, very, very, very interesting kinds of things at that time. So it was an age of, of real discovery. No. I mean, it's interesting that nitric oxide was never even discussed in the proposal, the SME proposal. Uh, but Charles had one orbit <laughs> yep. where, he linked, where he moved the spectrometer That's right. to the grading to look at nitric oxide. Yeah, and so he made sure that the, uh, the grading of the UV spectrometer was, was, was uh, programmable. So went up there and yes, we did. We measured nitric oxide. Uh, I didn't show you those results. I mean, we could, again, so many things. You know, in a small satellite, that um, so many 
different measurements, different opportunities. Was SME the first one that detected from space the polar atmospheric clouds? Did you detect those? It, uh, no, it wasn't. The, the SPUV instruments were. The Ogo. were the Ogo, uh, an Ogo. Ogo 6 was the first. Was the first. But they were looking down. This was the first limb measurement, probably, wasn't it? Was the oh, that was a limb engine as well? Yeah, it was okay. a little experiment that just happened So you, what you ought to do is get Gary Thomas to give one of these talks, who is, <laughs> oh, right? Thank you. Thank Gary you. Is, is the world's expert on polar mesospheric clouds. Okay, so you would, and, and they are exciting. I mean, we, we've, we're discovering things with AIM that we had no idea. Charlie Barth discovered when he looked through the literature, that there were more SME papers on PMCs than work on those, which was pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. It yeah. Shows serendipity. Yeah, and the, and, and the other and the, the polar mesospheric clouds just lit up people's imagination, you know, and they, they loved that kind of thing. And and of course, Gary is the one of the leaders in the field. Has been for many many years. Yes. Uh, so. The CMA thing that happened last week, um, there's a, some websites, one was called spaceweather.com, and they post a lot of aurora. Right. Because, of course, you get a lot of air here. But there was a stunning picture that I saw over the weekend, and it was a dark blue, and it was attributed to nitrogen ionization. Uh, the poles that was taken from Norway. Is that a reflection of the uh, the uh, processes that you were showing us earlier? Yes, that's exactly, yeah. So, so the, uh, the aurora that you see visually is these particles at lower latitudes below 110 or so. That's where the visual aurora becomes. And, and what you see is nitrogen excited, uh, excited nitrogen um, glowing in the, in the atmosphere from that. I've never seen one, was that it it's interesting, though. Yeah, yeah. It was extraordinary. Yeah. What's and the I also saw the one. What's the physics? What's the physics that makes blue? Because it's real life. What's, what's different that makes blue? It's the nitrogen it's a, atoms being. It's in. It's in. But there are, the nitrogen is always up there. Yeah. Well, it must it's be green. a whole lot more energy. <laughs> must be the depth of the penetration. And red, you see a lot of greens and reds. Red is that's all. That's oxygen. Those are the green and red lines of oxygen. Yeah. The, the comment in the, in the caption was that it had to have been an extraordinarily energetic event. And so I was thinking that when we go back and look at the DMSP data and see if the if the electrons were. But the yes. real energetic electrons go down to lower altitudes. They don't dump energy up that high. Yeah. Well, and I think it was taken in northern Norway, but I don't remember which direction he said he was looking. Mm -hmm. Well, it was looking farther south. Yeah. 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 I, I have a picture. I'll show it. Do. Very interesting. It's it's probably a color balance in his case. There's, there might be some of that. I, I, I wondered about that. <laughs> yeah. But the other colors that you saw in the picture uh, looked reasonable. Looked right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you always get the oxygen emissions, as you said, that, and they're red and the color of the, yeah, the, color of the, the red and the green line Close. of oxygen. And even, on, even with a soft... Yeah, it was extraordinary. Yeah, color. yeah even with a soft... Uh, uh, Vanessa up there? Well, it's coming through a camera. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. They had the IR filter. But yeah, if you look at the top of the NASA, my remembrance is a little bit more. Oh, here. Yeah, it was a lot darker, blue like that. Okay. Very interesting. Yes, a blue. Yeah, it's it's is the sun recovering from its. Uh, Deep minimum. Right? Interesting point. This this cycle. Uh, hard to say. That's, that's such a small point. Yeah. Interesting though. Darker than that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.